But I'm not going to tell you about prison or torture. I'm going to tell you about my nightmares when I get out of prison. You think like when you survive prison, your life is amazing again. You get back to your new life. You're going to feel happy. You have a great life. I got out of prison. Just when I arrived to Europe, start to receive calls. When I just create Facebook account or Twitter, families, mothers, fathers, siblings of detainees call me and ask me, have you seen my son? Have you seen my brother? Have you seen my wife? Have you seen, have you seen, have you seen? And something being killed inside of me, something the government in Syria was working in killing in a few years, my humanity. That was the moment I knew if I don't make my humanity be alive again, I will never win the war against the Syrian regime. I trust you are great people. Show me your great actions. Thank you. Hello, I'm Naomi Kohler, the director of the Simon Scott Center for the Prevention of Genocide at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. We're honored to host alongside the Syrian Emergency Task Force today's discussion. The young man in the video, Omar al Shogri, was 15 when he was first arrested. He was arrested seven times and tortured. This March, he made the plea that you saw to the American people and government. I trust you are great people. Show me your great actions. His plea has been the plea of millions of Syrians for almost 10 years now. As an institution committed to the history of the Holocaust, in which 6 million Jewish men, women, and children were systematically persecuted and murdered by the Nazi regime and its allies and collaborators, we know all too well the cost of inaction. In the case of Syria, we've watched crimes against humanity committed by the Bashar al-Assad regime unfold before our eyes. Today's discussion focuses on the urgent need to stop these atrocities and the U.S. government's steps to implement the Caesar Syrian Civilian Protection Act. Just as with the Holocaust, the Nazis' crimes were enabled by an array of actors, so too are the state-sponsored crimes by the Syrian regime. Years in the making, this act focuses and builds on existing executive orders to prevent governments, individuals, and companies from directly or indirectly funding the Assad regime. In doing so, this, along with the conditions articulated for lifting the sanctions, which include advancing justice and accountability, helps to deny funds and raise the cost for the Assad regime to commit atrocities. Yet the act is not a silver bullet. For those whose lives have been lost, it will come too late, and the act alone will not be sufficient to end the killing. Questions exist as to whether we can truly compel the government to change its behavior, and how it will be implemented, the legislation, in a manner to minimize the unintended consequences to the Syrian people. We hope to explore these questions today. What is clear is that for those who are wondering if they will survive detention, face future bombardment, be able to feed their families, or return one day to Syria, the implementation of this act presents a rare ray of hope. We know that sanctions can, under the right conditions, influence the behaviors of perpetrators including through cutting off assistance from those who enable their crimes. This can, in conjunction with other policy responses taken by governments, often in coordination with each other, help raise the cost of committing atrocities, advance efforts to attain a political solution, and save lives. Today, we're honored to be able to hear from Ambassador Jim Jeffrey about the U.S. government's efforts to implement the act and take steps to end atrocities, from Moaz Mustafa, the director of the Syrian Emergency Task Force, from the House Foreign Affairs Committee Chairman, Engel, Ranking Member McCall, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee Chairman Rish, and Ranking Member Menendez. Before turning to Jim, I would like to acknowledge the man whose name the act carries, Caesar. I would like to thank Caesar for entrusting the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum with his file in the United States. At great personal risk to his life, to his family, he refused to be a bystander to atrocities. We consider Caesar a hero. Because of him, we have an unprecedented level of verified information, the brutality of the regime for those held under detention. The images he smuggled out helped set the historical record of what occurred, laid a foundation for future justice and accountability, and has helped some of the families of the missing learn about the fate of their loved ones. 
I'd like to thank our Syrian partners whose tireless work to try to save their loved ones and build a better future for their country is something that we are forever grateful for. The United States Holocaust Memorial Museum would also like to thank the congressional champions who spent years working to get to this moment. This act is a truly bipartisan effort. We thank HVAC and SFRC leadership, past and present, and the many members who've been instrumental in this act and the countless staffers who have worked tirelessly to make this a reality. The road ahead will be hard. For the sake of the Syrian people, focus cannot be diverted. The resolve of those committed to ending atrocities must be stronger than those intent on committing crimes. Before we begin, a few housekeeping issues. I ask for your forgiveness if there are technical difficulties. Please use the question and answer function located at the bottom center of your screen. Type in your questions at any time throughout the program. Please mention your name. And also, uh, the questions will not appear on the main screen as the chat function is disabled. We're going to try to get to as many questions uh, as possible. Right now, it is my deep pleasure to introduce Ambassador James Jeffrey, the Special Representative for Syria, Engagement and Special Envoy to the Global Coalition to Defeat ISIS. Ambassador Jeffrey is a senior American diplomat with extensive experience in political security, energy issues in the Middle East, Turkey, Germany, and the Balkans. Ambassador Jeffrey, thank you so much for joining us. Naomi, thank you uh, for having us on today and thank you for doing this. Uh, thank you for all of the work the Holocaust Museum does to remind us uh, that the past can be repeated if we're not careful. And that's what I would like to talk about today. Uh, I think many of you have seen the various uh, fact sheets and the uh, statements uh, by Secretary of the Treasury Mnuchin, Secretary of uh, State Pompeo and others. So I won't get into the details right now of the uh, legislation and the other executive orders that we are acting on right now uh, to sanction a new list of people. Rather, uh, we can do that if questions come up. I'd rather focus on two things that are related to all of this. First of all, uh, the relation of this to the people of Syria. Secondly, uh, the uh, role of uh, this uh, sanctions legislation and our sanctions generally and our overall strategy towards stopping the killing. And that is the most important thing. That is why, as we will hear in a, a minute, that uh, this legislation and our overall policy towards Syria is strongly supported in Congress, as well as in the administration uh, and by the foreign policy community in the United States, in the European Union, and uh, in most countries of the Arab world, because it is absolutely necessary to stop this horror in many ways from uh, chemical weapons use to weaponization of refugees by the millions to the rise of major terrorist groups to five armies uh, at uh, uh, arm's length from each other uh, in various parts of Syria, uh, sometimes with engagements. Uh, this is a terrible crisis and this administration is committed to ending it in a way that will help the people of Syria and help the region as a whole. The uh, title of the legislation itself says a lot. It's the Caesar Civilian Protection Act of 2019. Uh, its purpose is to use diplomatic and coercive economic means to halt uh, President Assad's murderous attacks on the Syrian people and to support a transition to a government that respects the rule of law, human rights, and peaceful existence with its neighbors. In other words, it is part of the overall U.S. and international community led by the U.N. strategy for resolution of this conflict, however difficult that is. So it's supported by uh, the Congress, by uh, most elements of the foreign policy community here, and by our partners and allies around the world. Secondly, it's focused on protecting the people and finding a resolution to this. Uh, that is extremely important to us. Uh, Congress has put in very specific uh, articles of this uh, law to ensure that humanitarian considerations are kept in view by the administration. We have to report to Congress on these. We have to uh, exempt certain activities from any sanctions if they are focused on providing humanitarian relief to the Syrian people. Uh, and uh, we will do our very best. Now, uh, our overall strategy is not to overthrow any government per se. It is to change the behavior. Uh, that list of behaviors in the CESA Act, uh, Naomi mentioned several of them. They also include not besieging cities, not barrel bombing um, uh, civilians, uh, welcoming refugees back, and of course, accountability for war crimes. Those are the set of things that we 
in the United States government and the international community demand of the Assad regime to resolve this dispute. Uh, we do not have a uh, magic wand to end his actions. What we're doing is putting him and his government under pressure. These sanctions are an important part of that pressure. They're not the only element of it. They're part of a comprehensive, coordinated plan that we do, again, in conjunction with our partners and allies, the UN, uh, under Geir Peterson, the envoy for Syria. Uh, now, there's two criticisms people can make. One is, gee, uh, this has uh, potential secondary or tertiary effects that could impact people in general. And it is true that uh, whenever you do anything with economic sanctions, you cannot be sure what all of the effects of that are. Uh, the second argument is, but this isn't decisive. This isn't, you know, to quote David Petraeus in 2003, tell us how this all ends. I can't do that. What I can say is, look at the alternatives. There are two. The first, we just turn our eyes away from this horrific tragedy and hope it doesn't happen again but the Holocaust Museum exists to tell us that is not the answer because it will happen again. And every time it happens, it has a tendency to come closer to us and our loved ones. The second thing is we should just go in and take these guys down. I spent four years in Vietnam and Iraq on the ground. I can tell you that option does not exist in all but the most extreme of cases. And that is the way it is with the American people. And it is probably good so. So, absent those other alternatives, this is what we're doing. We are committed to this. We believe we have uh, support from the American people and from Congress once again, and we're gonna continue putting pressure on Assad and on his partners, Iran and Russia, until we can get everybody to sit down at a table and finally resolve this thing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Jeffrey, for that. Um, at this time, we're going to turn to remarks from Representative Elliot Engel, uh, Chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, and from Senator James Risch, Chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Thank you to the Syria Emergency Task Force and the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum for convening everyone today. Your leadership and determination helped pass the Caesar Syria Civilian Protection Act and it will be implemented this week. For four long years, we fought to pass this important legislation, barrel bombs, chemical attacks, kneel or starve. The regime and its backers would stop at nothing to get the Syrian people to surrender. The Caesar Law, named after one of the bravest individuals I've ever met, a photographer who risked his life to show the world proof of Assad's atrocities. This sends a message to the regime and anyone who supports them that the United States stands with the people of Syria. For too long, the people of Syria have been held hostage to the Assad regime and their backers, Iran and Syria. This week, we hope to turn the tide toward a free and more prosperous future for the people of Syria. Hi, I'm Senator Jim Raish, Chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. It's my sincere honor to join you today. It's only fitting that today's event take place in partnership with the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. This museum is dedicated to ensuring that the atrocities of the Holocaust never happen again. Never again has become our watchword. Unfortunately, Syria confronts us with the horrific reality that mass murder and torture are not just things of the past. Indeed, over the course of this nine year long war, Syria's brutal dictator, Bashar al-Assad, has demonstrated that he will do anything to cling to power, including murder his own people. Assad, with the help of Russia and Iran, commits unforgivable human rights abuses, including indiscriminate bombing, deliberate targeting of medical facilities, the use of chemical weapons, and the use of starvation as a weapon. Against the backdrop of this violence, more than 100,000 Syrians have perished in Assad's prisons under inhumane conditions. They were brutalized, starved, and tortured. Indeed, the sheer magnitude and suffering of the Syrian civil war is difficult to put into context. Even the UN stopped keeping track of deaths in 2016. Yet Syrians are still dying. What is clear, however, is that we have a moral responsibility to prevent genocide and to promote accountability and justice. 
To Assad, we say, never again. At great risk to himself and his family, that is precisely what Caesar did. What started as one man's heroic efforts to show the world Assad's atrocities has led to a powerful tool to hold Assad and his criminal backers accountable. I give my thanks to our House colleagues and the State Department for their partnership and tenacity on the Caesar Syrian Civilian Protection Act. Passage of this legislation was a top priority for me, and to be here today to discuss its implementation is very gratifying. To those considering rehabilitating the Assad regime, this new law sends an unmistakable signal that the political path forward in Syria cannot pass through Assad. He is a pariah. All nations must recommit to a ceasefire continued work on the Constitutional Committee, and free elections as outlined under Security Council Resolution 2254. The Syrian people deserve better than Assad. America will continue to support the aspirations of the Syrian people. Thanks for allowing me to be with you today, and thank you for your efforts to keep attention on the plight of the Syrian people. I'd like to thank uh, Chairman Engel for his long time championing of this legislation uh, and his former colleague, uh, Chairman Rice and uh, current colleague, uh, sorry, Ranking Member McCall, uh, without them uh, and without the incredible work of uh, Senator Risch uh, and Senator Menendez and many others, we would not be discussing this act uh, today. I'd like to turn right now to our colleague, Moaz Mustafa, the executive director of the Syrian Emergency Task Force to hear from him about how this act came to be uh, and how it's being received by the Syrian people. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Naomi. Um, and I want to start off by thanking the uh, Chairman Engel of the House Foreign Affairs Committee um, uh, and, and Ranking Member McCall as well as Chairman Rich and Ranking Member Menendez um, for their amazing leadership um, in helping this bill become law um, and also for taking part in this important program today. And I want to thank Ambassador Jeffrey and the State Department for their tireless work on behalf of Syria for joining us today and for ensuring the correct and powerful implementation of the Caesar Syria Civilian Protection Act. And I really want to thank the Caesar, the, the photographer, the person who risked his life and the life of his family so that the whole world may know exactly what the unfolding never again moment in Syria is. That today as we sit here, hundreds of thousands remain in Assad jail, men, women, children, and elderly being brutalized and tortured in some of the most sadistic ways anyone can imagine. You know, I think one thing that's really important for everyone to know is that these are um, in, in, in his journey to, to the United States, the first place that he came to, and the first place that we as the Syrian Emergency Task Force came to when, when we had um, the almost 55,000 photographs of, of, of victims was the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. And the reason that we did that is because we were disillusioned with the international community, disillusioned with governments that have turned a blind eye um, or just gave us mere statements of condemnation as horrific things happened in Syria. And the, the Holocaust Museum is, is something that reminds us of the worst moment in, in our history, but also compels everyone to do more to ensure that never again is not just a you know, baseless statement, that it means something, that, that we turn memory into action, um, as, as one of their slogans says. Um, and we are grateful for the amazing work of the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum because without them, um, I can tell you, um, we wouldn't have um, the Caesar Act that we have today. And I also want to thank all of those who supported um, the passage of this bill from Syrian American community and organizations to um, non-Syrian American organizations, individuals, groups, people that, that believed in human rights. Um, the journey of the Caesar Bill, of course, begins in 2014 um, when, uh, the, when Caesar testified before the House Foreign Affairs Committee in full disguise with pictures of some of his photos surrounding the members and the staffers in that committee room. And that morning, that summer morning, I remember everyone just listened 
in stunned silence as they heard this powerful testimony from Caesar and saw these photographs that again showed how horrific the Assad regime is um, and reminded us of some of the worst moments in history like Rwanda and Bosnia and others. And it was these amazing dedicated members of the House and their staff, both Republicans and Democrats, and later on with their colleagues in the United States Senate that decided that something must be done, that we cannot listen to such testimony and see such photographs and then go about our lives. And that was the beginning of a long journey of the Caesar Serious Civilian Protection Act, which I can be, I can say very proudly as an American, both Republicans and Democrats, the White House and the United States Congress have, have now made sure that this act is, the, is law and are implementing it in a way that stands in solidarity with the Syrian people and holds the criminals accountable. The numbers in Syria are, are not new to, to people, and, and I just want to remind everyone, almost 14 million displaced between internally and externally, over half a million dead, the UN stopped counting at some point, as Chairman Rich mentioned, um, and hundreds of thousands of men, women, children, and elderly, including American citizens, sit in Assad's dungeons today. The Caesar Act represents a ray of hope to the people of Syria, and it's a powerful tool that can only be successful if the United States government, if the international community all work in, and build upon this, this powerful tool to ensure that we reach the point where we all want to see, which is the end of the killing in Syria and a political transition that allows Syria to be ruled once again by its own people and not by the horrific Assad regime and its supporters. Assad, Russia, Iran, and Hezbollah have been counting on a military victory. They think they have a green light to use chemical weapons, torture, displace, detain, kill in whichever ways they want. Um, but the Caesar Act, I hope, reminds those criminals that they can no longer count on a military victory where they can reoccupy or occupy large parts of Syria, God forbid, and then say to the world, you know, reintegrate me into the international community and, and go on. There can never be peace in Syria without justice. And the Caesar Act is, is a path towards holding those criminals accountable while standing up for the Syrian people who have been starved by the Assad regime, killed, displaced, and detained. Thank you again for everyone who's put this event together, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Moaz, for that. Uh, before we move to the discussion, I'd like to turn to uh, Representative Michael McCall, Ranking Member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, and Senator Bob Menendez, the Ranking Member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Hi, I'm Congressman Michael McCall, the Republican Leader of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. It's an honor to speak with you about the Caesar Act so we can get justice for the people of Syria. I want to thank the Holocaust Museum and the Syrian Emergency Task Force. Their work helps to make sure the world knows about the Assad regime's ongoing crimes against humanity. Yesterday, the administration announced new sanctions under the Caesar Act, further isolating Assad. I strongly supported the Caesar Act, written by my good friend, Elliot Engel. Caesar's photographs are clear evidence of the Assad regime's atrocities. Sanctions under the Caesar Act are a long overdue step to hold Assad, Russia, Iran, and Hezbollah accountable for their crimes against the Syrian people. The world cannot accept a butcher like Assad as a leader of Syria. We cannot normalize relations with him, and we should do everything we can to urge other countries not to engage with Assad economically or diplomatically. There could be no justice if relations with Syria return to business as usual. You are all part of this effort. You have dedicated yourselves to telling the story of Syrians, yourselves, your family, and your friends, and even strangers. We are grateful for your courage to share these stories and for your courage to relive your own pain so the world cannot forget those who are still subject to the regime's brutality. Your will to survive and to help others survive gives us all hope. After the Holocaust, the world made a promise 
of never again and never forget. Today, we have an obligation to the people of Syria to apply those principles here. Never again, never forget, and most importantly, no more. Hi, I'm Senator Bob Menendez, the ranking member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Thank you to the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum and more importantly to the dedicated staff of the Syrian Emergency Task Force who continue to shine a light on the atrocities of the Assad campaign and advocate for the Syrian people. For more than nine years, the murderous Assad regime has waged a brutal campaign of destruction against innocent Syrian civilians. The Syrian campaign holds a horrific place in history. In 2011, peaceful protesters took to the street to demand reasonable and just reforms for their government. Transparency, accountability, support for those members of society who need it the most. As history has tragically taught us, dictators frequently invoke cries of terrorism for justifying attacks against innocent people who threaten their power. And while the Assad regime was neither the first nor the last to respond to peaceful protesters with violence, the ensuing and ongoing brutal campaign against civilians, against doctors, hospitals, and individuals who continue to try to save their compatriots' lives, its actions to prevent humanitarian organizations and the United Nations from providing basic humanitarian relief and food supplies to certain people, those actions have reserved a dark and ignominious place in history for Assad, as well for his backers. We cannot overlook the fact that Assad could not commit these atrocities without the enthusiastic and capable support of his Russian and Iranian backers. Without their air power or manpower, we would not see bombs raining down on hospital wings. We would not cities, see cities, I should say, ripped into shreds. We would not be seeing thousands and thousands of innocent people forced to flee their homes only to have to flee their places of refuge yet again. History will also remember the world's response. Whenever we confront violence and injustice, we are reminded over and over again that responsibility lies not just with the perpetrators themselves, but with those who have borne witness to these atrocities. Standing silent as children are slaughtered with barrel bombs, as families are deliberately starved to death, as the leader of a country uses chemical weapons against his own people, standing silent is not an option. We have not done enough. No, there is nothing we could or can do that could ever be enough. But we have taken action. And we have a responsibility to those who have given their lives and those who continue day after day to continue to risk their lives not to stay silent. Congressman Engel nobly led the charge with the introduction of the Caesar Civilian Protection Act four years ago, and last year with bipartisan and bicameral support, the President signed the core of its components into law. With the Caesars Act's implementation, legislative and executive branches of the United States are not only sending a strong united signal, we are taking strong united action to make clear to the world that we are not acquiescing to the Assad regime's continuing drumbeat of war and his campaign against his people. We are sending a clear warning to those who would seek to bolster the Assad regime and its supporters. While this legislation will not end the immediate suffering of the people in Syria, it is one tool we have to continue to fight these atrocities and to show the people of Syria and to the world that the United States is watching, that we have not forgotten their suffering, that we are pushing for a better future in which the people of Syria are free. Thank you again for the work that you continue to do. Thank you to Representative McCall and Senator Menendez for those incredibly powerful statements and the reminder of just how deeply bipartisan the commitment is to trying to halt the atrocities being perpetrated by the Syrian regime. 
Uh, at this time, I wanted to open it up for a discussion with the, the panelists before moving to taking questions from those viewing online. I'd like to remind everyone to please use the question and answer function that's located at the bottom center of your screen and type your questions in at any time during the program to reach the moderator. As I mentioned, we'll try to get to as many as we can. Ambassador Jeffrey, I wanted to ask you a question regarding the impact that the sanctions regime will have, or you hope it will have uh, on the Syrian government. We're getting a lot of questions and, and many people have been asking about how it will be administered in a way that doesn't impact average Syrians in a, a negative way. And I was wondering if you could speak to that particular question. It's one that we always confront when we're dealing with the application of sanctions. Uh, and I'm curious just what your reflections are on the steps that are being taken to make sure that there aren't unintended negative consequences to the, the Syrian civilians who are suffering now, and uh, especially in light of the dire kind of economic hardships in the country. Uh, thank you, Naomi. Of course, I protected myself from just that question by saying that I couldn't guarantee uh, uh, a total um, uh, protection from secondary and tertiary uh, effects of any act we as an administration or any administration takes in the foreign policy field. But let me get to what we're doing here. First of all, uh, it's very important to focus on what the act does in several senses. Uh, the act in the other uh, executive audits that we have uh, administered by the State Department and the uh, Treasury Department list specific activities. For example, uh, the CISA Act asks for an examination of the possible money laundering of the central bank, which has been sanctioned by other executive orders, but that's another important area. Uh, and it focuses on, uh, again, the actions of the government and those who uh, support the government, but also uh, the aviation, military aviation industry, given the uh, critical role, and I've seen the photographs of them actually doing it, of uh, Assad aircraft dropping barrel bombs. Uh, secondly, on the reconstruction sector, because that seems to be the area where the regime oligarchs are trying to, uh, after seizing property from citizens that they have driven into exile, uh, then building what I call uh, luxury complexes, uh, playgrounds for oligarchs uh, right in the middle of uh, Damascus and other areas. A third area is on the energy um, sector because of the critical role that fuel plays in uh, uh, the movement of Assad's tanks and the launching of Assad's aircraft. So, uh, and the other legislation focuses on one or another specific activity that could be tied to uh, the government's ability to conduct war on its own people. So that's the first thing. They're very specific. They're not saying uh, no more bread to be baked in Syria or anything like that. Secondly, uh, the sanctions basically uh, take certain steps on those people who are doing these activities or those people or institutions, including importantly banks, that are financing or supporting these activities by denying, first of all, travel to the United States, but secondly, very importantly, in all of our sanctions uh, efforts, uh, denying access to the dollar-based uh, financial and monetary system worldwide. That is a very important sanction, but it's one that doesn't automatically impact uh, the economics of a country. What it does impact is the personal economics of the criminals that we're trying to target. Uh, that is, no matter where they go, they're going to have to find an ATM, they're going to have to find a bank, they're going to have to find uh, a money lender. Uh, who doesn't want to deal in American dollars. And boy, that's hot. You can do it, but it's a lot of effort, and it undercuts one of the things we have seen, the role, the, the role of cronyism, the role of personal enrichment in this whole campaign, not only by Assad's henchmen, but by, I'll just leave it at, those who support him. Uh, the second thing is we uh, exercise foreign policy uh, due diligence in selecting who we are going to target. Uh, I read at the beginning the purposes of the legislation. It is to stop uh, the violence against the citizenry and push the government to uh, adopt what we would consider normal international and national norms of uh, governance and behavior. Uh, we have to justify internally 
every single person or in every single entity, because many entities have been sanctioned in this set of trenches yesterday, uh, every single uh, uh, name, entity, or person that is on this list, we have to justify internally. We are under the review of Congress that is very aggressive uh, and very interested, as you've already presented to us uh, today, uh, that we execute this in a proper fashion. So I'm quite uh, confident that, again, nothing that we do specifically will contribute to uh, a major economic dislocation for the people. I think it will lead to an economic dislocation of the activities of the regime leadership. I don't know some of the secondary effects of that. What I do know is that right now we have a de facto ceasefire in pot because of our uh, international set of sanctions and efforts and pressure from Turkish military deployments to uh, the UN efforts to our own and European Union sanctions. And that ceasefire is keeping 4 million IDPs, internally displaced persons. I was at the border visiting some of them and the refugees uh, just a few months ago with uh, our ambassador to the UN, Kelly Kraft. Those people are ready to bolt into Turkey, creating further havoc in Turkey and in Europe, uh, and much death and uh, dislocation if the regime launches the offensive. We believe that this is part of the package of uh, steps we're taking to stop exactly that. That has to be measured against theoretical impact that people sometimes come up with. I don't deny that it's something we're concerned about, but we're certainly very, very concerned about an offensive in Idlib, as is the UN, as is everybody in the international community. I'll stop there. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Jeffrey, for that, and just for the, the very frank and candid um, uh, discussion around the challenges that come when trying to, at this stage in a uh, crisis, enact measures. We know that acting earlier often creates a, a broader set of, of tools that one can use uh, and the costs become a lot higher the further along we are. But at, at nine years in, um, as the members have said, we simply can't stand by and uh, accept the atrocities to continue to happen. One of the things that's interesting about the, the legislation and the act um, and the implementation that you're doing right now is that it is trying to counter some of the efforts that are underway to normalize relations with the Assad regime, including around reconstruction. And we know that some countries in the region and elsewhere have been seeking to reestablish relationships with the Assad regime. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to what some of the efforts are um, that you can make public to engage with those governments, make them aware of the consequences of the implementation of this act and try to uh, discourage efforts that might um, inhibit uh, the, the goals of the act? Uh, certainly. Secretary Pompeo, for example, in January of last year, uh, spent almost 10 days visiting close to a dozen uh, countries in the Arab world to make clear to them that this was not the time to open up diplomatic and other ties to Assad. We have taken a quite tough position on the countries that have been uh, most uh, I won't use the word aggressive, it's a color word, but most eager uh, to do this. Now, and we will continue to do this. Now, in fairness to these countries, because we talk to them and we ask them, why are you doing this? Well, as maybe I'll take a, an opportunity here just to ask you a question. Uh, there has been a lot of discussion of the Caesar legislation in the Syrian news. Um, and much of it has been uh, articulating uh, the narrative and I think Ambassador Jeffrey acknowledged that there may be unintended consequences and every effort is being taken by the administration and by Congress to try to anticipate and mitigate those. Um, but part of the narrative in the press is that this will impact um, the Syrian public in a very negative way. Uh, and I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to how Syrians are responding to the news of this legislation, what their concerns are, uh, and what you believe can be done to help ensure that humanitarian assistance and support for Syrians who are truly struggling in an incredibly difficult uh, time, um, especially under uh, economic duress and with COVID as well, uh, how they can be protected. So the Syrian people have been, and I think to the whole world, incredibly inspirational in their resilience and in what they have endured over nine years of war. And what we hear today from the regime, its state television, its spokespeople, whether it's Hussein Shaban or their ambassador to Russia and others, 
is the same lies, the same misinformation that the Assad regime peddled all along, right? This is the same regime that said the Syrian people gassed themselves with chemical weapons. This is the same regime that says there's no, you know, there's no political prisoners in Syria and, and the Caesar photos are, are not even real, right? This is a regime that's laughable in its incredibly, you know, just in its propaganda. And, and what they have, what the regime has done to Syria beyond displacing and destroying it and all of that is it obliterated the economy completely. Um, and so, you know, as Ambassador Jeffrey was saying, you know, this act is going after those that are living in wealth, those that are uh, living through their corruption and killing of Syrian civilians and making money and, and being fine, while all the Syrian people are suffering, including those that are loyal to, to the regime. And what's been really inspiring lately in terms of this is that we've seen protests come out across Syria um, against the regime, not just in places where the opposition are, like in Idlib or, or in the Northeast, where the international coalition is, but also in regime-held areas. And I have to sort of give my full respect to those amazing Syrians in the governorate of Sueda and others that came out and, and said clearly to the regime, the reason the economy is gone, the reason the Syrian part has been falling for years um, is because of the regime's cronyism, corruption, um, and murderous campaign against the Syrian people. And recently, instead of the regime buying medicine for, for pharmacies that have no medicine in Damascus, the capital, can you imagine? Instead, he buys brand new MiG-29 from Russia that he may kill civilians in Idlib later. And so I think for the most part, the Syrian people understand that this regime is one that is full of lies and that wants to always uh, put the fault on the United States or the West or anyone else while it's killing its people. And at the same time, people are worried. I think people are scared. You know, they don't know what will happen. When you can't find food or bread to feed your family, um, then you are vulnerable sometimes for some of this misinformation. I think what's really important for, is for everyone to understand that out of at least, you know, my experience, I don't know of sanctions legislation that has more stringent humanitarian exceptions than the Caesar Act does. The Caesar Act, of course, also calls for increased humanitarian aid there. Um, and so for the most part, I would say even those loyal to the regime, uh, and especially those loyal to the regime and within the regime itself are calling out the lies of the Assad regime because they know, for example, the fight between Rami Makhlouf and Assad alone help the, the, the Syrian town continue to fall. And the cronyism and the corruption of this horrific regime continues to enrich itself while imp impoverish, you know, impoverishing everyone, including its own supporters. Thank you so much for, for that, Maz. Um, and I think what you're alluding to is that there is a lot of discussion within Damascus and when, within Syria more broadly about this legislation. Uh, and a real recognition that this is something that has the force of the the entirety of the U.S. government uh, behind it, and will continue to be uh, implemented. This was the first uh, tranche, as you said, Ambassador Jeffrey. Uh, and our understanding is that there will continue to be announcements made uh, over the coming weeks and months uh, as it pertains to to new entities that are going to be um, targeted through this act. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct, yes. And so I wanted to touch on one element um, that we haven't discussed, and that is that part of the act seeks to also inhibit the ability of uh, Hezbollah and other entities, that uh, militias that are being supportive of the Assad regime from being able to carry out their activities. I was wondering if uh, both of you could comment a little bit on uh, why that is so critical and uh, how you're going to go about trying to actually ensure that the, those who are supporting militarily the Assad regime are also um, uh, targeted in, in this particular uh, implementation period. Uh, let me start, uh, Naomi. First of all, in the first tranche of uh, sanctions, uh, it was actually under the uh, uh, executive order passed back in uh, October, uh, Secretary Pompeo um, sanctioned two entities. They're military entities. One of them is the uh, Fatah Mayot Division, which is essentially uh, Iranian-backed militias. 
Uh, and they include people from various countries. Uh, and that's an example of who we're going after. The other is uh, uh, Mahad Assad, the brothers, uh, fourth armored division, which is famously uh, involved in uh, human rights abuses and mass attacks on civilians. So we are going after military organizations. Uh, and their leadership. Uh, four, no, three leaders of the uh, fourth division, for example, were also uh, specifically sanctioned. Uh, this requires some work on our part, some investigation, some working with Syrians who have very, very good information on what's happening in their country on who exactly is doing what. Uh, it's a long-term process. Uh, it takes some time, uh, but we have a lot of people working on it, and these are very enthusiastic people. And just to add to that, thank you, Ambassador Jeffrey. Um, you know, we, the, the, the bill goes after all of those armed actors that are fighting alongside Iran, Russia, and the Assad regime. And, and Fatimi Yun is a fantastic example that has already been listed under the executive order uh, in 2019 that, that Ambassador Jeffrey mentioned. And we hope um, that in the days to come, and, and, and this should be, I mean, the Caesar Act is a clear warning to anyone that is fighting alongside the Assad regime, that's in addition to those that support the Assad regime or work on reconstruction. And, you know, whether it is the Wagner mercenary group that has been, you know, doing horrific things in Syria with the Russians, whether it is the Popular Mobilization Fund or the Iranian-backed militias uh, that Iran has brought in, uh, or anything else that's killing Syrian people are all liable for sanctions under the Caesar Act. And we are incredibly grateful for for this powerful and aggressive way in which the State Department, with the leadership of Ambassador Jeffrey, uh, is pursuing uh, the implementation of this of this act and and and, uh, and the powerful support that they have from Congress and and we as the Syrian Emergency Task Force, as I'm sure many other uh, um, Syrians and, and and those that are working on the conflict are working very closely with the State Department to ensure that we can provide all the information possible to ensure that we can get some of those very important designations out through the summer months or in the open-ended future of, of this bill. Thank you both for that. Maybe just one last question before we open up to the audience. Um, we know from, from other situations where sanctions have been used that uh, often uh, those intent on committing crimes look for loopholes and ways to get around sanctions. Uh, and in this particular case, one area of concern that has emerged um, comes from kind of middle people who are working on smuggling in uh, oil and others uh, to the Assad regime, um, including some cases coming from areas within the country, such as the, the Northeast. And I was wondering how uh, the administration is thinking about uh, its approach to, to dealing with that incredibly difficult uh, question. Uh, again, all of our sanctions actions, once they're announced, and once we're executing them, have to meet two criteria. First of all, it has to be activity that has been listed in the CISA Act or one of the other three executive orders that we turn to. Uh, that's a necessary but not sufficient condition. The second condition, and it is in the preamble to uh, <clears throat> the CISA Act, the statement of policy I read uh, earlier, uh, it has to be uh, in pursuit of <clears throat> our uh, overall goals and specific uh, tactical diplomatic uh, decisions related to uh, putting pressure on the regime. Uh, there are activities that may be um, sanctionable, with the emphasis on a bull, uh, that we see out there someplace, but we don't see them as a priority to sanction because they're not necessarily uh, simply serving regime interests. They may be serving other interests that we're interested in preserving or advancing. I'm not going to get into any uh, decisions because you can't imagine how many times I've been told, mm -hmm. do not talk about any sanction, any potential target of sanctioning that the U.S. State Department, the U.S. Uh, Treasury Department, and the White House has not agreed on. We don't rule anything out. We don't rule anything in. But I can assure you, we will adhere to exactly those criteria in making our decisions. That's what we've done so far. I cannot imagine us not doing. We certainly aren't going to sanction things that aren't in these laws and executive orders, and we certainly aren't going to shoot ourselves in the foot, not even uh, uh, the U.S. government in my 50 years uh, for all of its ups and downs does this uh, blatantly. We'll be very careful. Thank you for that. We're going to turn now to um, questions from the audience uh, for around 15, 20 minutes. 
Uh, I, we're getting a lot of questions, and I, I should say a lot of questions also from uh, individuals in Syria as well. Uh, one of the, the questions that has been coming up is how this new um, implementation of the act is going to interplay with the political efforts that uh, the U.S. government is undertaking. And Ambassador Jeffrey, you have alluded to and talked about um, U.N. efforts, the, the Geneva talks. Can you discuss what the interplay is in the, the approach? Uh, sure, Naomi, and I could do this for the next three days and uh, confuse everybody, including myself, because it is very complicated. We have about eight international and Syrian allies in what we consider our uh, overall coalition to try to implement uh, the relevant UN Resolution 2254, which aims at the same goals that the legislation has laid out. Uh, that's the European Union, it's uh, the Arab League states, it's Turkey, it's Israel, uh, it is the UN itself and its various agencies, all of whom have been helpful. Peterson, the uh, Syria envoy, leads the effort, but the uh, people who do humanitarian relief, the people who do refugee relief, they've all been really amazing. Uh, we also have, of course, our Syrian opposition partners, our partners in the Syrian Democratic Forces, uh, and other elements are probably forgotten. But on the, uh, let's say, the 100,000 foot level, we basically have a plan A. That is laid out in 2254 that everyone, including Russia and China, approved in December of 2015. That is the classic uh, resolution of a conflict model that we all know most of us have worked on. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem is there is a plan B. The plan B is Assad's plan that up to now has been, uh, with some limitations and hesitations, supported by Russia and very aggressively by Iran, which is a military victory that will obviate 2254, obviate the role of the UN and thus the international community, and present us all with a fait accompli. Assad in control of the entire country, all of his crimes notwithstanding, he then needs to be supposedly welcomed back to the international community. That is what we're pushing against. These sanctions are part of Plan C. Plan C is unrelenting long-term pressure on the regime to raise the costs to the regime and its supporters and to make it more difficult for them to do things like carpet bomb Idlib. We're having some success, but not complete success so far tactically on that. I'm fairly pleased with um, uh, what's been happening on the ground, what's been happening in the UN, what's been happening in the uh, OPCW on condemning uh, use of chemical weapons, what's been happening with the uh, Trump administration strikes uh, in response to chemical chemical weapons that has reduced dramatically, uh, Assad's uh, actually using them. So we're having tactical success there. What we haven't achieved yet is the real goal, which is for the regime and its supporters to shift from plan B, their military victory, to plan A, which is the UN supported international community backed conflict re resolution mechanism. That is our goal. That's the only way this will be resolved because I cannot see us stopping our plan C until the others stop their plan B. I'll leave it at that. Thank you for that. And just for a reminder for those watching, um, the resolution that was referenced uh, calls for the ceasefire, but also for steps to be taken towards a political transition uh, within Syria. And as you mentioned, Ambassador Jeffrey, the challenge is that those who've been providing uh, military assistance, including Russia, Iran, and others, um, remain committed to a particular course. So this long-term effort to try to change the calculus of the Assad regime, um, it requires also, as you said, changing the calculus of those who remain committed to supporting them. Uh, and I think there has been, as Moaz mentioned, interesting developments just within Syria in terms of the protests that are occurring, but also emerging dissent within the uh, inner circle of the Assad regime as well and divisions that are occurring. One of the questions that we have from the uh, audience is around how you anticipate that the Caesar Act and its implementation will, will have an impact on kind of regional dynamics. And I know that many watching are, are very interested in, in how Lebanon in particular um, will be impacted, what it means. I was wondering if uh, Ambassador Jeffrey and Mo, if you could comment just on how you see the regional interplay with the implementation of this act. Uh, thank you, Naomi. I'll start, uh, but Moaz may have more to add because he's someone who's been on the scene. First of all, 
we normally and correctly focus on the statistics uh, and our um, congressional representatives. We're good in laying them out. The half a million or more people we believe uh, have been killed, the over 100,000 put in prisons. There are 12 to 14 million people who have fled their homes have been driven from them over half the population to escape Assad, uh, the chemical weapons use, uh, the barrel bombs. But at the same time, the uh, situation in Syria <coughs> has caused great consternation regionally for several reasons. Uh, one is the rise of uh, significant large terrorist organizations capable of striking outside of Syria. We saw that with uh, uh, Daesh in Europe, particularly in 2015, and hold large swaths of territory. Uh, there was a response to the misrule and the incompetent military uh, efforts of the Assad regime, but they're a real threat to us. Um, Hayat Tahrir al-Sham is another one, uh, basically located in Idlib, there are others. So that has, uh, there are concerns that the Turks have about uh, the PKK uh, developing a very strong foothold in the Northeast. So that mm -hmm. is Turkey concern. Uh, then there is the Iranian effort, not just to provide militias to help Assad stay in power, uh, we don't approve of, but we can at least understand that. It's in the uh, normal repertoire of uh, uh, thuggish states uh, acting to support their thuggish friends. But Iran then using uh, Syria as a platform for a bigger and far better and far more strategically threatening southern Lebanon, uh, moving in missiles, moving in drones, moving in radars, moving in other things uh, to threaten not only Israel, but the various other states. And I can name at least three others that have been hit by missiles made by Iran in the last year in that region. Uh, that is a strategic threat. So the result is uh, various other countries have sent military forces in. The Israelis, although they often do not uh, admit that, uh, Turkey, obviously, and, and quite uh, uh, openly, and the United States and its coalition partners in northeastern Syria and in al Tamf in the south. Uh, that further complicates the situation. And uh, again, none of those armies are there to overthrow the Assad regime, but they're all there to respond to threats to their uh, security that have been generated by Assad in the way he's conducted that campaign against his own people. There will be no resolution of this conflict until we not only have a government that treats its uh, people better, but a government that responds positively to uh, the security concerns of the neighbors. Now, in addition to the th uh, neighbors I've mentioned, Lebanon is a complicated case because it is uh, financial and through Hezbollah, mm -hmm. very, very deep diplomatic and political ties with the Assad regime. This is not an accusation that it is furthering the Assad regime's um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, interests and such. Lebanon, of course, has taken in a tremendous number of refugees, percentage-wise the largest of any country, and it has done well by them for the most part. Uh, it has also suffered from terrorism, from Daesh uh, in the northeast of the country. Uh, and we um, are working closely with Lebanon to try to resolve these and other problems. But we cannot turn our eyes aside that A, Hezbollah has a huge role in Lebanese politics, particularly on anything that has involved Syria or Iran, and B, uh, the Lebanese banking system has facilitated uh, the economic and thus the military activities of the Assad regime. And therefore, uh, there is some secondary damage uh, potentially from things we do, things other countries do. And I would just add very quickly that in terms of regional countries and as far as in terms of countries all over, I mean, I just want a constant reminder to everyone that the Caesar Act, based on its powerful and, 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 and fantastic work being done with the leadership ambassador, uh, Jeffrey and, and the team over at State Department and the Treasury, and with the strong support and oversight of the United States, States Congress, ensures that this act is a warning. It is warning to people in the private sector or public sector, whether they are in Lebanon, in Gulf countries, or anywhere else. If you work with the Assad regime, you are liable for potential sanctions under the Caesar Act. And that, of course, will have a direct effect and hopefully a chilling effect on the support of the killing and terrorism of the Syrian people. Thank you both for that. Um, one of the things that, that I'm really struck by when I, I look at the actual legislation 
um, is the clear conditions that you have articulated, uh, that Congress articulated for the, the lifting and easing of the sanctions, um, which I know has been part of the political discussions that have been uh, underway for a long time. Uh, and some of those conditions include allowing uh, unfettered humanitarian access, uh, releasing political detainees, allowing for a safe and dignified return for refugees, but also one component that has been um, called for in the, the legislation is to establish a genuine accountability, truth, and uh, reconciliation process. And I was wondering if you could both speak to uh, whether or not you've seen any progress or steps taken in that direction um, by the regime how you think that the act might help to uh, reinforce those efforts. And if there is no movement, um, we might know the answer there. Uh, what, other, what are other steps that other governments can do to help reinforce what you are trying to achieve in terms of justice and accountability? I think Moaz should start because that is something that has to be done by the Syrian people. Thank you, Ambassador. And, um, you know, very little hope that the Assad regime will release all the detainees or stop killing civilians or get rid of Iran, the occupation of Iran, uh, the occupation of Syria by Iran, excuse me, um, or do anything toward justice, right? This is a regime that is sadistic, incredibly evil. And just a reminder to especially the Syrians that are watching, the Caesar Act is the very least the United States and the international community can do. I think the whole world um, should be ashamed that nine years on, a never again moment continues to unfold in Syria. But that being said, I think it, justice must be served in Syria. If we want to see a political solution, if we want to see reconciliation, if we want to see a transition and moving forward in the future for Syria, we must see justice. And the fact is that the Syrian people um, have a very strong sense of nationalism, whether despite what part of the beautiful mosaic of the Syrian you know, there's, you've got Christians and Muslims and Kurds and Alawites and Sunnis. And, and they are all have lived together for thousands of years, despite the Assad regime that has been a very sectarian regime that has divided them. And so the ICC, unfortunately, is not an option for Syria because Syria is not a signatory to it. And because if we get a, uh, we need a referral from the Security Council in the UN, which is constantly vetoed by the Russians. And so we have the Syrian people, the amazing people like Caesar, uh, like Omar, who, who was on the video earlier, and others have, have you know, relied on national courts and relied on working within civil society on the ground um, to ensure that you know, we hold the, the people that are doing crimes accountable. And at the same time, we try to heal the wounds um, that, have, that have been caused by the Assad regime's crimes. Um, but there's very little hope to see the Assad regime doing any of the provisions of the Caesar Act because it's just not in its nature. Um, and, and, but I'm very, very hopeful for Syria's future as long as there are friends out there that are willing to pursue justice in an international community that can continue to focus on Syria until the war is over. One of the questions we had was around kind of the avenues that do exist, and I think it is important to acknowledge the incredible work that's been undertaken, um, led largely by Syrian organizations themselves to uh, collect evidence, evidence document, try to find ways to hold individuals accountable, um, be that people who have been found to be living in, in Germany, for example, or to find creative avenues um, through loved ones who have uh, tried to bring cases uh, on behalf of their deceased family members in Spain and elsewhere. Uh, it's been incredible to see the innovation that has come in the field of justice and accountability as a result of the work that Syrian organizations and others have been doing. I think the Caesar uh, file, the 55,000 images, which for those um, who are unfamiliar, please go to our website and you can learn more about both who Caesar is and also what has been happening in the detention centers, uh, helps to pave the foundation. As um, Ambassador Stephen Rapp, the former Ambassador for Global Criminal Justice uh, for the United States and who's a fellow at the museum working on these issues often says, since the Holocaust, there is no other situation where we have as much evidence of the state-sponsored commission of large-scale crimes against humanity as there is in Syria. And what is 
I think really important to underscore is that when you ask the question of justice, what does justice mean? For many Syrians, what they're asking for is actually international criminal justice. They want to see cycles of impunity ended. They know that the permissive environment in the past, both with this current regime and also his father's, has created an environment where unless that changes, uh, unfortunately, people living in Syria will continue to face crimes. Those who seek to return will remain at risk. Uh, and these dynamics will, will continue to persist. So it's, uh, I appreciate the comments um, uh, in regards to the importance of accountability. I'm going to end with one question from uh, a Syrian uh, viewer. And it, they've asked, how can they, as an average Syrian, help the US government monitor the effective implementation of the Caesar Act? Uh, it's a very genuine and beautiful question and a really challenging one also to, to answer, but I, I thought that it would be important to give voice to uh, their interest in trying to affect change as well. Uh, I'll start. First of all, stay alive. Uh, that's uh, a very important uh, condition for being an effective uh, force against the Assad regime because we know how it responds to those who speak out against it, however peacefully they do it. Uh, so uh, be careful, stay alive, find ways. Again, uh, Naomi, you went through this in uh, uh, commendable detail, uh, the importance of uh, individuals documenting the crimes, noting who the people are, uh, physical evidence such as photographs, again, we have to go back to Caesar, are extremely powerful. What this does is, uh, and this also gets to your last question is, it has led to something that's also extraordinary. It's not just the United States or the European Union, countries that could be accused of being uh, uh, partisan on the Syria debate, uh, speaking out. It is Secretary General Guterres, who in his letter in response to the 2504 resolution on humanitarian crossings that cut two of the four on Russian demand, spoke out against that action and said they had to be reinstituted. It is his calling for a board of inquiry that just published its damning, damning statistics on how time and time again, the UN provided coordinates of in Idlib, hospitals, mosques, and other facilities that were not to be bombed and that after they were passed to the Russians, suddenly they were bombed, Some, uh, sometimes uh, in what's called the double tap so that the second bombing would get the fer heroic first responders. That has been documented. It's the OPCW that under ferocious opposition from Russia and some of its friends still uh, had the uh, uh, inter international investigatory uh, team uh, lay out compelling evidence that not only did Assad's troops use chemical weapons three times in 2017, but that this decision was taken at the highest levels of the Assad regime. This is something we don't normally see. Normally, it's us and countries that are opposed to us throwing accusations about behavior back and forth. It is rare to get the international communities, uh, organizations of record, organizations of credibility, such as the UN, to take a position speaking out against not just UN member states like Syria, but permanent, represent, permanent members of the Security Council. This is unusual. It says two things. First, how deep the international disgust at what's going on is with Syria. Secondly, the courage of the Syrian people who've provided most of the information on which we, the UN, and other international organizations base their judgments. Keep it up. That's my uh, call. And if you don't mind, Naomi, I'd like to just add something quickly. Um, I agree with everything that Ambassador Jeffrey said. And I want to, in addition to stay alive, stay strong and know that the Syrian people are much stronger than this criminal regime. I mean, imagine with the Russian Air Force, with, the, you know, Iranian ground troops, with chemical weapons, with detention and displacement and everything, that's a regime still not able to occupy all of Syria. The Syrian people remain resilient. And ordinary Syrians have done extraordinary things. Caesar is the greatest example of a nationalist figure that is a hero, not just to Syria, but he's a hero to the world in terms of his humanity and the work that he has done. And, and 
whether the person that asked the question or anyone else, the State Department has been working seriously on the implementation of this bill. They care about the lives of Syrian people and they disagree with what the regime is doing. Should there be more done? Yes. Is, is the Caesar Act too little for what the Syrian people deserve? Yes, but it's a powerful tool. And if there are any information um, of, uh, that can help in the better implementation of this act or in other ideas, reach out to us, whether it is a Syrian Emergency Task Force website, syriantaskforce.org, or on our Facebook page in Arabic or English, and we are happy to relay that message to our dear friends at the State Department and in Congress and elsewhere. But stay strong, stay alive, and God bless you for, for your resilience. And, and really, the Syrian people, history will, will note that even when the world did very little to help them, they stood up against the worst evil, and God willing, they'll be victorious. Thank you both for those incredibly powerful remarks and, and message to uh, our Syrian viewers today. Uh, just in closing, I, I want to end with where we started with Omar's words. Uh, that question of, have you seen? That's the question that so many people today are asking. Have you seen my mother, my brother, my sister? Uh, for those who are in detention, for those who are in Idlib, separated from their family members, for those who are stuck in Rukban camp with almost no access to life-sustaining resources, for those who are facing threats in the Northeast, for those who are living in exile, wondering whether or not loved ones are still alive or not. For them, this is a continual struggle to try to survive, to try to find a way to marshal the resilience that Omar talked about that's needed to endure the atrocities that continue to be committed. And I think uh, as our two speakers have very eloquently shown and as the members who have worked so tirelessly to make this uh, act a reality and enable the government to have the tools to try to change the behavior of the regime and those who are directly or indirectly supporting it, uh, there is a deep recognition that it is not enough, but it is necessary. And the commitment is one that is enduring. Uh, our commitment as an institution is to continue to stand with the Syrian people to make sure that the world knows the crimes that are unfolding, that we cannot say that we did not know, uh, that we cannot pretend that there were not moments, including earlier, where perhaps different courses of action could have been taken. And we will have to reckon with that uh, in each of our own consciences, but also, as Ambassador Jeffrey said, uh, we will have to, as institutions, as governments, review what our response was to almost now a decade of large-scale horrific atrocities that are unfolding within Syria. So with deep gratitude to uh, Ambassador Jeffrey and our colleagues at the State Department, uh, to the Syrian Emergency Task Force, to Representative Engel, uh, Representative McCall, Senator Risch, and Senator Menendez. Thank you for uh, participating in today's discussion. Uh, this will be placed online so you can view it or share it with others. Uh, and I'd like to just end uh, by thanking uh, Caesar and thanking all of the remarkable Syrians and civil society partners that have continued every single day under unbelievably difficult circumstances to try to find a way to protect, to warn of incoming attacks, to provide life-saving resources so that people continue to live. And uh, I know it's not enough, but uh, and it's hard to comprehend that we are still in this particular spot uh, where we don't know when the killings will end. Uh, but we continue to strive to work with you uh, to make sure that the world does not forget. And as uh, Representative McCall said, you know, never again, never forget, and no more. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today.